Welcome, welcome, welcome uh, to the inaugural edition of Ryan's Rants, uh, where we talk everything in the reconstructed uh, catastrophe business. My name is Ryan Davis with FMD Holdings, fund my deductible, and I'm here with my co-host, Ryan Holiday. How's everybody doing? Ryan Holiday here from Ink Payments. Uh, we're super, super excited to, to have everybody joining in on us, and we have what we considered one of the best guests and one of the most polarizing figures in the catastrophe reconstruction business. Uh, without further ado, Stephen Badger Esquire with the Zeal Law Firm. How you doing, Steve? Good, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm privileged to be your uh, first guest on Ryan's Rants. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely, Steve, and, and everybody's labeled you as uh, Darth Vader in the and in the industry, and I, I think you kind of eat that up a little bit. And I wanted to start by telling everybody how I always wanted to stay off your radar being uh, uh, in the cat catastrophe business because I'd always heard all of these infamous things about you. And and so the way I first met you is whenever Fund My Deductible really started taking off, uh, uh, I got a call from you one day. And it was pretty alarming. I never wanted to be on your radar. But uh, after you talked to us and found out about our collection methods and what we were really trying to do in the industry was the right thing. And it wasn't just a, another one of these gimmicks contractors come up with to uh, try to waive the deductible. You were 100% on board and have been one of our best cheerleaders. And we sure appreciate that. Well, you bet. Absolutely. Once I uh, learned what your program uh, was, uh, and how it worked. Uh, it uh, certainly uh, was something that was good for uh, the uh, contractors you work with, good for my insurance company clients, and most importantly, good for Texas uh, homeowners. And uh, I think what people realize is that uh, I'm not out to screw any homeowners over. Uh, I'm not out to screw any contractors over. I just get upset when people try to rip off my clients. And uh, so if that doesn't happen, uh, we're, uh, we all share the same uh, objective in these matters. Right on, right on. Uh, so we sent out a questionnaire. It's kind of funny. This kind of shows you where, where you are in the industry. Uh, we sent out a questionnaire on several uh, uh, Facebook uh, posts and on several other things. And it was funny. Nobody really wanted to put their questions underneath where I said, hey, we're going to have a special guest and Steve Badger, but man, my inbox blew up on private <laughs> messages. Everybody had a thousand questions for you, but all of them without exception put on there. Well, don't tell him I'm asking this. Don't tell him I'm asking this, but they all, all had questions. And, and, you know, it's funny. One of the main questions that people asked was, well, we had several contractors ask the same question. Hey, why do insurance companies uh, include Ridge and starter in the waste factor? And I had to answer to everybody, man, that's so far off Steve's radar, you know, not even in his wheelhouse of what he does. You know, we can't even entertain that question with him. So, but it brought up the point, you know, what, what really is, are you tasked to do? At what point do you come become involved when a contractor's ask, acting bad or, or when a claim? Yeah, so obviously uh, my role is to represent the insurance carriers in disputed claims. And uh, so my law firm, you know, I've got 27 lawyers in Dallas who are all representing insurance companies in claim disputes. So any type of garden variety dispute, whether it's an adjustment dispute then that needs to be addressed through appraisal or through litigation, uh, that's what we do. Now, myself personally, uh, you know, I'm in a unique role because I get asked to get involved in matters that involve what my insurance company clients believe to be improper conduct, either some type of scheme uh, to, as I like to say, rip off the insurance companies or just flat out fraud. Uh, so absent a scheme uh, of some improper conduct or fraud, uh, most contractors uh, or public adjusters or building owners aren't going to see me. Now, do I get involved in some uh, adjustment and coverage disputes? Uh, I do, uh, and the interesting ones that uh, uh, present a unique coverage question. But uh, you're only going to see me if there's something uh, that my insurance company client believes, and I agree, is uh, nefarious going on. Right on. Right on. Well, you mentioned appraisals there, uh, and I know you mentioned it when the storm, too, and this was one of the questions from the audience that, that you really had an issue with 
uh, representatives for the insured rushing out and you know being early on getting lawyers or trying to get an umpire prematurely appointed uh you know we've all seen that on on our side the carrier doing that as well and i really wanted your opinion on what do you think can be done to you know to clean up that process how do you where do you see the proper time is and what notification should be and stuff of that nature, Steve. What do you yeah, so, so many issues there. So let's, uh, let's focus on just the unilateral umpire appointment. All right. I hate it. All right. Because the only reason you go get a unilateral umpire appointment is to gain a tactical advantage in the appraisal process to get your guy who you think is going to give you a good award to get him appointed. Uh, and that's not the intent of the appraisal process. The intent is to amicably and cooperatively work to resolve a dispute without the need for litigation. Uh, and uh, so when a uh, unilateral umpire appointment occurs, uh, it's because somebody's trying to game the system to get a tactical advantage to get a good award. Uh, and that's completely contrary to the intent of the appraisal provision. Now, do I recognize that some courts have said that, well, reading the strict language, either side can go do this unilaterally. Yeah, some courts have said that. Uh, and as a result of that now, everyone's having to deal with uh, changes to the appraisal provisions, provisions that worked for 100 years. There's an old Texas Supreme Court case from the 1890s, and the appraisal language at issue in that case was damn near identical to the language today. But now, because a few individuals decided to try to game the system for their own uh, uh, financial gain, now we're all having to go rewrite the appraisal provisions to make it clear that both parties have to go together to get an umpire appointment. Sadly, that's how it worked for 100 years. But now, because of the conduct of a few, uh, we're all going to have to change the provisions and do things differently. And that's unfortunate because we ought to do it together. So how do I think it should work? I think the two appraisers should agree at the beginning of the process, hey, if we can't agree upon an umpire, I'm not gonna run down to a courthouse, you don't run down to a courthouse, and let's approach a judge together with our names that we provide and then try to do it cooperatively uh, so we can be fair and reasonable in the process. And you guys hear me say this all the time, right? Let's just be fair and reasonable. Be nice. I catch a lot of grief for always talking about being nice. Uh, but I really think that's what we all need to do. And when I have insurance company clients who aren't nice, uh, I call them out as well and tell them to be nice. So, yeah, I'm really uh, wound up about this unilateral umpire appointment scheme going on uh, because it's uh, it's unfair in some cases, it's unethical. Uh, it's clearly intended to game the system. It needs to stop. You mentioned some insurance companies have done it. Yeah, I know they have uh, recently in a, a reaction to avoid the other side doing it. But my law firm has never done it, nor will we. If we go down to get an umpire appointed, the other side will know about it. They'll have an opportunity to appear. And that's the right way to do it. And, yep. and that, that seems super fair there, Steve. It sounds like a lot of judges are doing that as well, whether or not the policy provides for it or the appraisal clause provides for it. These, uh, these judges are, are sending notification to the, the opposite side, no matter who does it. And I think that kind of levels it out a little bit. Well, the judges are doing it because they don't have any idea that they're being uh, implicated in a scheme to get a tactical advantage. And the letters uh, that the judges are receiving says, hey, dear judge, it's appraisal. Here's the language. Please appoint this. They think it's an amicable process, but they don't know that the names are being given uh, are ones where the uh, that side asking for the appointment knows is going to give them a favorable award. Uh, so what we have found is that once the, all this is brought to the judge's attention, uh, that uh, they're being implicated in this scheme, they want no part of this any longer. Uh, they do the right thing and they back out and say, quit coming to me, go to the court where this is actually pending or work cooperatively and do the right thing. Right on, right on. You know, Steve, there's a, there's a good point that you kind of brought up um, in that answer. And I think that this industry is very much uh, like the wild west and it seems to be, you know, convolution or interpretation of, of the laws and the regulations um, and especially here in Florida, where 
you know, you have contractors, um, and now because of the uh, the new uh, the new law that just got passed, there's there's a lot of interpretation going around as to you know how a PA can be involved with a claim, and and obviously the contractors in Florida know that they should not be representing themselves as insurance specialists or something to that effect. But um, in those cases where before they would be referring a public adjuster and now they're even scared to refer a public adjuster uh, because they don't want to be the expert but if there's a, a an apparent claim and the insured needs representation that's typically what they would do so now they're scared to even do that I mean why is there why is there so much uh, why is there so much cloudiness around you know all these rules and regulations that are put forth by by the carriers and that are lobbied for uh, you know, by, by, by their, uh, by their representation. <laughs> Again, so much there to, uh, to address. Um, so let me just say with respect to the Florida legislation, um, it was modeled very generally based upon our Texas legislation from 2017, uh, our hail bill 542A. And so you'll see a lot of the same provisions in the new Florida legislation that we have in our hail legislation uh, in Texas. And uh, Florida uh, reached out to me, uh, the people who were involved in the drafting and the uh, advocating for the legislation reached out and they said, hey, we look at this, give us your thoughts. Uh, is it fair? Are there any traps or issues here? Uh, and I looked at it and I think what you're gonna find in Florida with the new legislation is no different than what we found in Texas after the Hale bill was passed. That if someone is being aggrieved by an insurance company, they still have a remedy. Right. And they have a remedy they can pursue. There's a couple of hurdles they have to jump through now. But our hail legislation, like the new Florida legislation, was intended to address some of the abuses and try to resolve matters pre litigation. So sure. is there always going to be some ambiguity in legislation? Are people going to try to interpret it differently? Sure. We're going to get to that issue when we talked about deductible waiving, aren't we? Yeah, so that's clearly what's going to happen. People are going to try to find loopholes. Now, the other issue you raise, the issue with respect to what a contractor can or cannot do to avoid UPA uh, and referrals and those things, I'm not aware of anyone who's telling uh, contractors that they cannot recommend a public adjuster. All right, so I don't see, and I don't have any personal objection to a contractor saying, hey, you know, you might uh, need a PA here to help you out. Uh, I have always been very careful to make clear that I have no general opposition to the involvement of public adjusters in the claims process, right? That's their role. They're statutorily allowed to do that. And if a contractor wants to tell a, a homeowner that, hey, I think this one needs a, a public adjuster, what's wrong with that, right? And in fact, if I'm going to be uh, intellectually honest, uh, and complain about contractors being involved in the claim process, which I don't like when they negotiate claims, then it would be unreasonable for me not to uh, allow them to, to do it the right way and uh, recommend a name of a public adjuster or a policyholder attorney to a homeowner. So that should be allowed. And if there's some interpretation of the Florida law that concerns PAs uh, or concerns contractors about doing that, I'd like to see it. Uh, have someone send it to me so I could read it, uh, because that's certainly, uh, there's no law in Texas like that. Uh, and uh, we encourage contractors to, uh, to uh, you know, not uh, step out of their lane and to allow a PA or policyholder attorney to address that situation. We, I, uh... you, mute, you muted there, Ryan. Sorry, I didn't realize I hit the button there. So Appreciate the feedback there, Steve. I, I uh, know we had a PA that actually asked a question. Um, since we're on the topic of PAs, they said, well, it said, I had a PA ask about an article that he recently read where you mentioned that PAs have a carve out of the law, which would otherwise be considered the unlicensed practice of law, but doesn't seem to be defined anywhere. In your opinion, can a PA quote case law as it refers to an insurance claim? Ah, so the public adjuster statute uh, is a carve out for the unauthorized practice of, of law. So let's go back, right? So prior to 4102, which is our Texas public adjuster licensing statute, prior to that, when there was no licensing of PAs, but they were out there acting as public adjusters, 
the state bar of Texas unauthorized practice of law committee started going after them and saying, you can't do this. Helping someone in a claim is the practice of law. So that's what led to these licensing statutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, legislation was passed to create this carve out to allow them to negotiate claims. So when I say that uh, a contractor who's negotiating a claim is involved in not only the unauthorized practice of public adjusting, but also the practice of law, that's because only public adjusters who are licensed under this statute enjoy this carve out. Now, the carve out does not give them carte blanche to do anything, right? 4102 does say that a public adjuster cannot practice law. Right, there's no ambiguity there. It's, it just says it flat out. Uh, but it is that the statute has defined what they can do in the claim process to assist the homeowner. So I do believe there's a reasonable argument that uh, when a public adjuster starts providing pure legal analysis in citing case law, that does look as though it constitutes the practice of law, which is prohibited by 4102. No one's ever going to complain about a public adjuster negotiating the claim. That's their job and, and helping interpret the policy issues uh, and, uh, and debate those issues. But when they're actually citing case law, you know, that's what a lawyer does. And um, so I'm not going to jump up and down and go after a public adjuster when he says, hey, Badger, the such and such case says this or that, or he says it to one of my clients uh, in just a discussion. All right, but if I'm getting a four page legal brief from a public adjuster and we see those sometimes and we uh, all know who those PAs are who like to play lawyer, well, I'm going to uh, push back on that issue uh, when appropriate. Absolutely perfect, perfect. What it, everybody kind of wants to know the, uh, the background of Darth Vader. Uh, Steve, we had several people ask how you got into the business, how, how you ended up being who you are in the industry, kind of the go-to guy for the carriers. Uh, and, and, you know, if you would kind of give us a quick bio on, on you and, and how you got to where you're at, my man. Yeah, it's an interesting story. You know, I started at Zell in 1992 uh, and I was a brand new baby lawyer there. This is the only firm I've ever worked at. And I got asked in 1992 by a partner to go down to Miami and look at subrogation potential for Hurricane Andrew losses. Uh, and as uh, most of you know, subrogation is when an insurance company pays a claim, then they have a right to sue the bad guy who caused the damage and get their money back. Uh, and so what I became was a plaintiff's lawyer. I was a plaintiff's lawyer working on a contingency fee, but my clients were insurance companies. Uh, so I was unclear to me whether I should join the plaintiff's bar groups or the insurance company groups, because I was a plaintiff's lawyer, but represented insurance companies. So over the next decade, I did nothing but roofing related subrogation matters. So I sued architects, engineers, contractors, material suppliers to recover insurance company money that was paid in roofing related matters. So I learned all about roofing. I learned all about hail. Uh, I even sued material manufacturers who put out products that were not capable of performing in a reasonably foreseeable hail event. So I was kind of the, uh, the construction guy in Texas for weather-related subrogation claims. Then I moved to New York and spent a decade of my life leading the subrogation effort on behalf of the insurance industry uh, for 9-11 related losses. Uh, and uh, I insured, my client insured the World Trade Center. So we, uh, we filed a subrogation action against American Airlines and United Airlines to recover the $2.4 billion that my client paid to rebuild the World Trade Center. So we settled that in 2010. I moved back to Texas. I was actually going to retire from being a lawyer. Uh, it was a successful case. It turned out well for my firm. And uh, I was going to go open a bar up in Park City, Utah and do something different. Uh, but swear to God, true story, a client called me, one of the same clients uh, who I did a lot of work for. They said, hey, Badger, we're here. You're back in Texas and we're getting all these damn hail claims more than we'd ever seen. And they're all disputed. And we'd act like you to help us on some of them. So for the very first time, I got involved in defense work. Uh, I switched from being a plaintiff's lawyer suing people in subrogation to defending insurance companies. 
And I quickly saw what the hell is going on. And I could see this trend of more lawsuits, more disputed claims. And it's obvious what had happened. Uh, and Hurricane Ike, uh, with all the litigation in Houston, uh, Steve Mostyn and others, uh, people said, wow, there's a huge industry here of going after insurance companies. So the number of public adjusters in Texas uh, increased from 75 to 1,000. The number of storm chasing contractors increased and the number of plaintiff's lawyers who called themselves policyholder attorneys went through the roof. And we could see that. So I saw it happening. I saw it be a good opportunity uh, for my firm uh, to, uh, to help the insurance industry with these issues obviously generate more clients. We're all business people uh, in whatever we do. Uh, and we grew uh, from having just a few hail matters to now having a, you know, a thousand of them in the office and uh, you know, becoming the, the hail guy that I guess I am now. And it's interesting, you know, I am a passionate person, right? So I brought my plaintiff's lawyer mentality to uh, this uh, defense practice uh, and in doing that, you have to be aggressive. Uh, so we aggressively uh, defend our clients' interests uh, in these matters. And uh, so that's how I got the Darth Vader uh, label. It began with John Hotelling uh, at uh, Win the Storm a couple of years, referring me, uh, to me as that. And then as you know, y'all, many of you know, they presented me with the Darth Vader helmet replica helmet in 2020, and uh, which is now proudly displayed in my attorney lounge uh, at my office in Dallas. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there whenever you said passionate, and just like the story uh, that I tell everybody about how you finally came on board with, with uh, Fund My Deductible, um, I explain to people whenever they, they, they call you names that we better not repeat here, I say, man, the man has got a job to do, and he's just as passionate about his job as you contractors, you PAs, are about yours. And I think that boils down, you know, to, to being passionate about what you do. You get labeled one way or the other uh, from the opposite side. Yeah, you do get labeled, and I, I represent insurance companies, so it's an easy label to call me a bad guy. All right. But uh, what I think people will see, and I hope they see, uh, is that there's a lot of what I do is really intended to protect the consumer. You know, one of my proudest moments was after the uh, 2019 legislative session where we passed the Hale bill and we tried once again to pass roofing contractor registration in Texas because I view those as consumer protection bills, both of those. And as a result of my work, the consumer protection reporter for the Dallas Morning News, a guy named Dave Lieber, the watchdog, uh, he gave me his Hall of Fame award uh, for my work in trying to help consumers in Texas uh, avoid the problems associated with bad contractors who rip consumers off. Uh, and I, I was really honored to receive that because it recognized that I'm more than just an insurance company lawyer. Uh, I really do things to help the consumer. You know, I represented 108 homeowners in a class action lawsuit. Uh, I spent over a quarter million dollars of my own time uh, and my firm's money uh, in representing these homeowners against a bad contractor in Texas who ripped them all off for over $500,000. He took their insurance proceeds uh, and left, never replaced their roofs. So we chased him for several years, got a judgment against him for over a half million dollars uh, for these homeowners. Now, are we going to collect on it? No, he doesn't have any money but we pursued it. We drove them out of the business, got them away uh, from North Texas uh, so we wouldn't rip off anybody else. Uh, and I don't you know, necessarily want credit for that, but I want people to know that uh, I'm just not out there trying to make lives miserable for contractors and PAs. Uh, I, uh, I focus on issues where I believe there's a problem in the process uh, or uh, when someone's trying to rip off my client. Uh, and that's when I get really passionate. You know, at a, at a certain point, Steve, we're all consumers, right? You're, you're protecting all of us. And if you're involved in this industry and you're uh, always chasing that profit, um, it, it's, it's, you sometimes forget that, hey, I'm a homeowner too, or 
you know, what if uh, what if I ultimately need this protection that that Steve's lobbying for? Maybe they haven't gone through it, but we we were we were having this conversation before where about the deductible. I said, you know, if 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 most folks in this industry would start going down the right path and and just kind of you know doing the right thing and not out you know, taking people's money or skimping out on jobs or giving away deductibles, deductibles drive me nuts. I tell people all the time if. You know, if, if you're a roof salesman and you can't get someone's deductible, you're not a salesperson, <laughs> you know, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you, you can't sell someone a roof for a thousand dollars. Come on. Um, but I, I think that uh, for the greater good of the just industry as a whole, if everyone was on a straight and narrow rates might go down, you know, uh, deductibles wouldn't have to be waived because everybody would be paying them. If every, if every company in town said, no, you have to pay your deductible, guess where that homeowner's not going to go to, to yeah. another, someone else who's given away the deductible, you know? So, um, something that we, uh, we ran it about a little bit on our, on our, uh, uh, you know, preemptive calls to this meeting. So, um, just something that we're passionate about as well, especially at FMD and Inc is, is really, trying to keep contractors and public adjusters and all restoration professionals on the right path to, you know, running a business that isn't, you know, stepping over the line or doing anything illegal. We, and it's, I think it's a lot of just education and helping them along with the frustrating parts of the process, the payments and the things that are absolutely necessary to get done. And, um, you know, we're doing everything we can to help the money move for them. So hopefully that keeps them from having to go out thinking they need to squeeze every dollar out of, the, out of your clients. So that, that's just kind of the reality of the situation, but. Yeah, and let me give you another reality. And I've been in, you know, representing the insurance companies for 30 years. Obviously in the past 10 years, I've been deeply involved with the in, uh, industry, both companies and trade groups on these uh, weather related claim issues. And I can assure you, the insurance companies don't sit around and say, hey, how can we screw people over? How can we make life more miserable for contractors and PAs? I've never been invited to such a meeting but I've been invited to dozens of meetings where they say, how do we address this issue? How do we address this abuse? All right. And that's what they do. They are not proactive on these issues. They're reactive. So everything you're seeing in a more difficult uh, procedure or, or field adjusters having less authority or new policy forms, all reactions to the abuse uh, that the insurance companies are dealing with. Uh, and, and that's why when I speak at Wind of Storm, I always hold up the book. And do I have it here nearby? No, it's at my office. Uh, you know, the goose that laid the golden egg. And I say, guys, don't kill your golden goose. All right, there's plenty of money to be made in the insurance claims process. If you're just looking for a reasonable profit uh, and you're just chasing the ones where there's real damage, you're going to have a really successful career and you can be a long time player in this business and make a lot of money. But unfortunately, you know, they go to these conferences, they learn how to scale it. I don't even know what scaling it means. I know a lot about growing a business, right? But this scaling it, I had to ask a contractor friend of mine, uh, hey, what the hell does scaling it mean and how does that relate to growing a business? Uh, and, uh, and she explained it to me. It's different. So grow the business. You know, you can make a good living off Xactimate profits. Uh, and I've got contractors after every win the storm, they come up to me and they say, Badger, tell your companies to send me their jobs. I'll work on Xactimate pricing. I can make good money. I'm now, sure they probably say it like this, though. They don't say it out loud, Steve. No, <laughs> no. They're, uh, they're, those are the ones hey. that are careful when talking to me. Yeah, Steve, Steve we'll, we'll take your Xactimate yeah, pricing if... Uh, Excuse me, I have to get rid of that. Sorry. We'll, we'll, um, we'll take your uh, Xactimate pricing all day if, uh, if all the line items are there. <laughs> look, oh, so let's, let's cover that real quick, all right? And I, I get asked this all the time. What about, you know, uh, Starter and all of those things and, and Drip Edge and all that? And I, I'm not going to engage in these, you know, one-off discussions because every company has a different uh, um, policy on issues. But what I would support, all right, and I would love to do it at some time, is to sit down with a group of interested stakeholders from both sides and say, let's try to come up with a standard Texas residential roofing specification. This is what needs to be there. So, okay, Mr. Insurance Company, you include this waste factor, you include this and that, 
and we're not going to throw in toilets, right? Because we know they're never going to get the toilets, or we're not going to throw in this or that. So let's agree to what really ought to be in it. Let's plug in the items and let's come up with what it's really going to cost at a reasonable profit to put on a simple Texas residential roof. And I would love to do that. And if we could get a couple of companies, big carriers to buy in on that in the process, then obviously others would follow. So productive things like that. And I want to talk about another productive thing that I know is about to go on uh, in the deductible world. Uh, I love dialogue, right? That's why I'm always talking. I, I accept every invitation to speak, no matter who it is. I caught so much shit when I first agreed to speak at Wind the Storm, all right? But I said, no, let's do it. Let's have a dialogue. And it was one of the best decisions I made because it's been good. Discussion is good, just like this. And I, uh, uh, I would love to see an effort to uh, create some type of uniform specification for what needs to go into a residential roof so we can stop driving ourselves crazy with all these little line item debates that we're having. And, I think and they, that uh, reminds me of one of the things that, that, uh, that several people asked me in our questions, Steve, on, on uh, uh, material surge. I wanted your, your input on it, you know, and how quickly prices are going up. Uh, I received notice from a, a, a supply house yesterday. They said expect 5 to 15% on materials on a monthly intervals for the foreseeable future. Where do you kind of see that that stopping and starting in the process, uh, whether a PA or a policyholder or a contractor is 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 putting their pricing out there? Look, I mean, we need to pay what the competitive price is uh, at the time, all right? And I've told my carriers that uh, look, pricing is going up. I've sent them the bulletins that the supply houses are putting out. All right, we don't like it. But it is what it is, using one of my least favorite cliches, you know, what the price is, is what the price is. And if that's what it costs to replace a roof, we owe it. Uh, so, you know, if you get an exactimate estimate and it says X per square of, of GAF shingles and you go to buy it and it's actually X times, you know, 150 percent. Well, hell, show the carrier and say, look, the pricing is wrong on here. I can't buy it for that. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, I, at least I'd tell my client, you know, look, if that's what it costs to buy the shingle right now, I'm sorry, but you owe it. Yeah. So yeah, you know, communicate and tell them, don't hide, uh, you know, any cost from them. Be open and say, here's the invoice. Here's what I paid. All right. And if, uh, if they don't pay it, well, that's a perfect dispute for appraisal, isn't it? That is a pure dispute as to the amount of loss. Uh, and that's something that can easily uh, go into appraisal. And if I'm an umpire and I see the contractor spent Y per square for shingles, he has an invoice there and the insurance company is only offering X and it's like kind of quality, all other issues, you know, being equal. Well, hell, I'm going to rule for the uh, homeowner in that one because that's what it really costs to uh, replace the roof. I, I got no problem with people spending what it costs to fix damage. What bothers me is when people try to profit off the claim process and put money in their pockets above or separate from a reasonable profit. Fair enough, fair enough. And so you, you said you had a, a, a new point on the what is most near and dear to my heart, the deductible. Um, what uh, what? And let me let me start by asking. You know, what are we seeing? Is do you believe that there's going to be some prosecution on this law? What, FMD has kind of become the receptacle of uh, all the the good actors telling on the bad actors, and 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 I've shared some of that with you. People still out there doing the advertising bonuses, still sign allowances. Some people just blatantly saying that uh, insurance companies can't tell me to do this or do that with with the deductible money. It's not their money. It's the homeowners money whenever all that's clearly laid out in the deductible laws but uh, one of the main questions i get asked over and over when are we going to see the perp walk when are we going to see somebody prosecuted for for breaking these deductible laws i know in in a holidays home market in florida they'll just flat throw your ass in jail over the deal but we're just not seeing it in texas and everybody's saying this law is a year old and and nobody's even getting slapped on the wrist what are your thoughts steve 
Yep. So, you know, I've got no desire, and I said this all the time, I've got no desire for anyone to be prosecuted uh, for a violation here. I know I, it seems a little draconian for a contractor to go to uh, go to jail for waiving a deductible. Now, if that gets to that point, okay, perhaps it's necessary. And that's why we made it clear in the revised legislation that there were two other enforcement mechanisms. All right. The first was the insurance company requiring reasonable proof of payment, right? The line that actually created your company. Uh, and I remember, I mean, I, it's no secret that I wrote the first draft of the legislation and shared it with the bill sponsors and they took it and ran with it. But we knew there had to be some mechanism to easily enforce this without being dependent upon the TDI or the AG. So we put that reasonable proof of payment in there. We gave examples. We knew people couldn't afford to pay the deductibles at times. So we gave the financing arrangement language. And wow, look how cool that's worked with you guys there now filling that space. Uh, and uh, I think it's great. So it's working in that regard. So then that's the first mechanism enforcement. All right, now I've heard some insurance companies aren't requiring reasonable proof. Okay, if somebody really uh, can tell me that's the case, all right, then let me know. And I will reach out to that insurance company and tell them, to do it. All right, come on. But all of my clients are, I see a lot of letters that say, thank you for your request for RCB holdback. Here's what we need. And there's a new item on that list and it's reasonable proof for deductible payment. So we've got that private right of enforcement. And I think that's the most important thing in the bill is that language right there. Uh, then we have also is that we've given the TDI and the AG the right to do other types of enforcement. And what I'm really hoping we see is something like what we see in the area of unauthorized practice of public adjusting, where the TDI will issue a, a cease and desist order, uh, or the AG will, and they'll tell a contractor to knock it off. All right, they have an administrative mechanism to tell the contractor, you have to stop waiving deductibles you are going to be paying a $5,000 fine for this and uh, knock it off. And then if they don't knock it off, then I don't feel as bad about some type of criminal prosecution uh, for it. So now the question is, well, why hasn't that happened right, to anybody yet? And it's a fair question. And my experience with the TDI uh, in particular, uh, and then also somewhat with the AG, is that they need help. They want to do the right thing, but they're tremendously understaffed. And what I have found in the past is that whenever I put together a package for them and said, hey, I'm aware of this going on, here's all the info, I write a long letter, I have 37 attachments, putting it all there for them, that allows them to invest much less time to then take that, turn it into their own work product uh, and take action. And that's happened a lot. It's happened with barratry by lawyers, and that's resulted in convictions. It's happened with fraudulent conduct by some PAs who have gotten in trouble. One's about to lose his license. And it's happened with contractors in the extreme examples of UPA. Uh, and it's resulted in cease and desist orders and fines. Uh, and those are all ones where I've turned in bad conduct with a nice package, and they've taken action. So the good news is this, I understand now that North Texas Roofing and RCAP uh, is, are putting together jointly, uh, I'll, for lack of a better word, I'll call it a task force. They're retaining a lawyer uh, and they're gonna get others involved like myself and maybe the NICB and others who get information, a group of interested stakeholders where there will be a place where everybody can send info to them about violators, and there will be uh, a lawyer charged with actually putting together the complaints and submitting them to the TDI and AG on behalf of the, uh, the trade groups and others. Uh, and awesome. I think that's what's really been missing. I've been pushing for this. You know, I just don't have time to do all of them. No one pays me for all this stuff I do. Right. My, I don't get paid for all any. I've never made a dime off the hundreds of hours I've spent on the deductible bill. I do it because I'm passionate about the issues. It's kind of become my hobby. Right. But now that the groups have decided to put some money behind an effort, hire a lawyer, 
uh, and actually get a little more organized. I suspect in the next few months, once this gets going, and also there's an announcement about it that this is going on now, uh, I think the combination of that effort may cause some contractors to say, okay, they're getting serious. I don't want to be the example made of uh, early on. I don't want to be the test case. Uh, and hopefully uh, we can see some enforcement come out of this against the bad abusers. Yeah, I know that I know this is a lot of this stuff that you're doing for the deductible law and some of the other things like you just said is 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 more of a hobby for you. Isn't it a lot more interesting than having a bar in Utah? <laughs> I don't know. I was going to ask Steve what it's going to take to get him uh, get him to open that bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure every I'm sure our viewers would like to know. How do we get Steve out to Park City? <laughs> well, go. I've committed to hang around a few more years. Uh, with my firm. Uh, I also have a piece of my 9-11 litigation. We're suing the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia right now for their involvement in 9-11. That's ongoing still, even as we approach the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So oh, I've got wow. some reasons. On a side note, my uh, oldest daughter was born on the September 11th, and uh, oh. you know she'll always have that, that smear uh, uh, on her birthday. And so anything that we can do to help uh, right the wrongs that happened that day, we appreciate it. Well, it's uh, hopefully we'll get this one resolved soon. It's if you're interested, it's an interesting case. Look it up uh, in the press. But uh, you know, I'll be around a few more years. Um, I'm looking for another fun uh, challenge, something different down the road. Uh, I don't want to be the hail guy forever, but I'm having a lot of fun right now. You know, this is all really interesting work, uh, and uh, so I'm going to stick with it for a while. So I think everybody's stuck with me for the, at least the next few years. <laughs> Well, we sure appreciate your time, Steve. Uh, we know you're a busy man, and and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a thousand more questions. You know, maybe at some point we can circle around and and uh, have a second version of this. But uh, we thank you again for your time. Well, I appreciate. It. Let me just say this again, as I as I finish every presentation I give and when I speak anywhere, dialogue is good. So s badger at zell.com. Everyone is encouraged to send me an email. Uh, I respond to all of them. I sit down every night with a glass of wine. Sometimes it's a bottle of wine. And I respond <laughs> to dozens of emails about various issues. And those emails come, you know, from all sides of the industry. Uh, I probably get, you know, three or four emails a week from contractors upset about others waiving deductibles. In fact, I got an email yesterday. Or I got a text from a contractor who says, can you believe this guy? He's hanging up signs in the neighborhood that still says, insurance negotiation specialist. Jesus, I thought we were done with that and everybody was smart enough now, you know, at least change the language. Uh, so I will respond, all right? If you got an issue, I'm happy to talk about it. You know, I can't help you with the individual, hey, Acme Insurance isn't paying for my drip edge, you know, isn't that horrible, what can you do? Okay, but you know, I can't, can't do anything about that. But broader stuff, I welcome a discussion with everybody. Uh, dialogue is good, and uh, let's always stay in touch. All right. Make sure you tell them carriers to pay for that ridge and starter. The, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll make sure I get a, a blast out right away to everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. Guys, Steve. thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks again. We appreciate everybody. you, buddy. All right, guys. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.